So I'm sure Philip doesn't need an introduction, but I'll give one anyway. Um, I got it wrong this morning, didn't I? You want Crazy Cat Lady first, mm -hmm. before cameraman and mm -hmm. blogger. Mm -hmm. Crazy Cat Lady and cameraman and blogger, Philip Blue. Over Thank to you. you. Thank you very much. So who here has um, ever used an FS7? You're not the person using an FS7, that doesn't really count, that's kind of obvious. <laughs> so I come from 17 years in TV news and 11 years freelancing and when I was in TV news it was all B4, uh, big cams and shoulders, big long 20, 20 plus um, times zooms, covered all the range, brilliant. Mechanics which are great, hard stop, smooth irons, all those things you really want. And then when I switched and started messing around with like 5D Mark II, which was back in 2009 when I got mine, it came out in November 2008. I started messing, it was actually before that I started messing around with SLR glass because I was using 35mm adapters and if you don't know, don't know what they are then don't worry but they're just these devices which we use on small sensor camcorders to trick it. So I started messing around with SLR lenses about 10 years ago. Um, real limitations with them because they're not designed for video. I shoot a lot of documentaries, I don't know what other people do. For me documentaries is what I make my money with. I need a lens which is going to be, cover my range that I want has, you know, it's pretty fast and it's accurate and focused because that's the key thing about large sensor cameras is we are, uh, we need, to, you know, we, depth of field is much more reduced and so it's, our uh, focus is much more delicate. So par focal is when you, um, if you look at this shot here, I'm in focus on the hotel, I zoom in and I'm still in focus on the hotel and I'll zoom out and it'll still be in focus on the hotel. Let me just switch to the um, first bit of noise we had. Right, here we go. DSLR lenses, SLR lenses are not par focal. It means when we got our, our zoom, we find our focus in, in the range. So we, we've gone, I'm getting a tight shot here. Oops, I get my tight shot and I go, okay, cool. And I decide, so, okay, I don't want to go to a wide. You go to a wide, and you won't be in focus anymore. It'll be slightly off. So when I'm shooting handheld and shooting like that, what I tend to do, even on a tripod, with SLR lenses is I change my field of view and then I always tweak the focus. It's a habit, so I do now because it's never the same. It always needs fixing. Whereas you've got a lens which is par focal, once you set the focus on the object and you change your, uh, your focal length, it's always gonna be in focus. And the reason it has that it's got a little knob under here, which is back focus adjustment. And using a back focus chart, once you set it, you lock it down and it's there. It will stay in focus. It also means infinity is infinity, which is really nice. When you're using SLR lenses, they always, infinity, you probably notice, infinity is never infinity when you're using it. They build in that tolerance. So because everybody is slightly different. And if they were all set what, what should be perfectly, if you ever your camera body is slightly off, then it could never get infinity. So they always give you a tolerance. So you always have to go just before infinity to get infinity. Constant aperture, so important. So there are other lenses out there which are um, of lower end of price. I'm saying not, not low. This is, this is about so over three grand in with plus VAT. Yeah. So you look at, this is called a Cabrio as well. And this is the same optical quality as that 20 or thousand dollar lens or pound lens that I talked about. And the reason they managed to make it um, same quality is they have reduced the range, whereas those ones are much longer. This, this, is, this is part of a two lens set. The second lens isn't out yet, coming out in the summer, and that's going to cover the range of 55 to 135. So split up into two lenses, which means they can keep the weight down, but also making it designed for a short flange of an E-mount, they're able to make the lens a lot shorter as well, reduces the weight. And they've used um, a different kind of plastic to keep the cost down as well, but it's all very, very robust and optically, it's absolutely perfect. Just feel how heavy this is, this is the key thing. You just go into some of those lenses in there, all those cinema lenses, my God, they weigh a ton. This is less than a kilo. This is less than a Metabones and a 24 to 105 Canon. It's the same weight as the 24 to 105. It, so, on yeah. its own, yeah, there yeah, you go. On its own. Yeah. Focus breathing, so um, again, SLR lenses, then they're, they're not, designed for video, designed for still. So they don't have to worry about keeping their focus because people use autofocus all the time on SLR lenses because it's for stills. It doesn't need that. And it's the same with focus breathing. It doesn't, you, when we're changing focus on a camera and you, if you, 
on cheaper lenses, you'll find that when you, 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 uh, so you focus closer to uh, get closer in, you'll find the image slightly zooms in. And if you go the other way, it slightly zooms out. That's called focus breathing. You see it much more on longer lenses. There is no focus breathing on here at all. You can see it on this shot here. This is uh, rack focus. So look at the top of this leaf here and how much of it is. And watch what happens when I pull focus onto the background. Exactly the same position. So I've tried um, other Cine lenses as well, and I tried the Sigma lenses, and I had focus breathing on it, on the 18-35 and the 55-100. to That's an expensive lens, more than this. So these are the key things, parfocal and constant aperture and no lens breathing. These are some of the key features of the lens. Comments on your on that uh, video of yours on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Comments there's a few people moaning about the blurred part of the image. Yeah, so all that uh, is... They didn't like it. No, they're, they're basing it on one shot, yeah. and that one shot is actually simply the bokeh from the macro is different to the bokeh from normal. So there's the shot on the... Um, of the sand, they're talking about the one on the sandcastle. And let me just play it here. So the bokeh on the sandcastle here is different. Has a sort of Gaussian look to it. But if you look at the bokeh normally, it's nice. It's just actually one shot they're judging on. Whereas the rest of it, it looks great. So that's all it is. The bokeh changes the thing. And I've, mm. I've gone out and compared it directly, done exactly the same shot with several other lenses and stuff. And it is the creamiest bokeh by far of the ones I tested it against. And have they said why they're not doing a calendar version yet? Is the, re is it just of the, the reason is because, yeah, well, the reason they make, make it so small and cheap is because the, the Canon flange is bigger, it means the glass will need to be bigger, hence more expense, hence heavier, so it'd be a different type of lens. The reason they were able to get it to this price and this quality was by making it native. Which you may say, oh, that's a bit limiting, but the, the Sony e mount system is so huge now it's not like it's there's only one camera that does it so many out there and they're not getting rid of it anytime soon i understand what you're saying because you know when i was when i first uh started get, using e-mounts i was just using metabones and canon because i did not want to spend more money on lenses and only slowly did i start buying a few native lenses when i you know i wanted to have a more compact like with the loxias i wanted to be more compact or when i started using the stills mode on the a7r2 and wanted autofocus but this for me is the most expensive lens I've got for the E-mount. I have no problem with having it because it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's not, this is going to keep its value. Unless Sony suddenly announce and say, we're no longer doing E-mount, mm. we're getting rid of it. We're going back to Menalta Alpha Mount, which they would never do. Um, although the A99 II, when that came out, was a surprise. Like, what? What's that about? But uh, yeah, the, the E-mount is going to be around for a, a long, long time. It's, it's obviously if you've invested in a Canon system. And yeah. There's another lens on that on the camera. Yeah, if you're, you know, if you're a Canon person, then you're going to have to buy one of those big, expensive Canon lenses. Or you could buy the Fuji Cabrio, the, you know, the larger Fujis, and get a mortgage. Is there a and servo stuff. zoom option at that end? Not on this lens, no. There's another reason why they're able to cut the price down, was remove all the electronics. So I'm not a servo guy anyway, because I, even, even when I had my B4 lenses, I never used a servo. Any time I ever used it, was when I was doing live OBs and stuff, when I had to zoom. So I was taught how to operate a lens by a great cameraman called Jerry back in my early days. And it was, you get focus by zooming in, finding your focus and moving out. So yeah, there is no smooth zoom option. But then again, as Jerry said, your eye doesn't zoom, mate. <laughs> so for me, yeah, I have no problem with that. But I know some people who like that, but it's not really my operation. Hey, you can always do it in post. <laughs> Your slow creep in on the emotional moment. My basic FS7, if I'm using the internal batteries, it isn't as good handheld because it doesn't have the balance. If you use an, uh, an external add-on like this, this is a Moth Cam one or the official Sony one. This official Sony one gives you uh, raw out. This one doesn't, it just gives you the V-mount options and power options. And it's much more balanced. And you need to have a, a decent shoulder pad as well. I mean, it's like this, the Canon C300. It's, no, it's, it's way better than the Canon C300. The Canon C300 is a terrible camera handheld, unless you 
find a way to rig it up. This is pretty good so far because it has the, the grip. And one of the improvements of the, of the FS7, or the FS7 II, it's, it's little, there's, a few, there's quite a few big changes, but one of the smallest ones is, is this. So if I want to pull the, the grip backwards and forwards, I just untighten this and loosen this. On the FS7, you need a screwdriver to undo that. So you can pull it out, which is such a pain. But I replace this with a, a shape handle myself for my FS7. That's one of the minor things that they've improved. Uh, the two major things that they changed on the FS7 II over the FS7 I is it has a new lens mount system. Still E-mount, but it's uh, locking E-mount. Locking E-mount, like a positive lock and variable ND, which I'll show you in a minute. So the way we use E-mount, it's really easy to change lenses, take lenses off, just like the Steels cameras. Very simple, put it on, locks. Now, you, you are gonna find that, this lens is fine. This lens is, is within the tolerance, easy tolerance of an E-mount. Heavier lenses can put more of a strain on it. This is a much more stable mounting system. And you, the way you take it on and off is, Let's put it onto there. Okay, so it locks like this. It does require, you can do it one-handed, but it's not as easy. It's, it's, it takes a bit of getting used to, so you need to make sure that your release switch is up, get your dots lined up. Line up, you're in line with the dots. Put it in. Am I recording? I am, whoops. That'll be a great shot. Line it up. There he is, and then pull this tight. Come on, there we go. And you, now, don't over push it, don't over tighten it because you're just going to have a nightmare trying to release it. But now it is really solid. So, for heavier lenses and stuff, it's not going to have any flex at all. If you are using a heavy lens, you still want to have some lens support underneath it anyway, just to make things a little bit more supported. But this is very good. So, to release it, you simply um, turn it all the way, it won't fall off until, grab our lens at the bottom, find the release switch, it comes off. It's a two-handed operation there, whereas that is a one-handed operation. So that's, that's the trade-off. So the, the, uh, there's a couple of other minor things that they've tweaked on it. It's, internally it's the same camera, it is the same camera, same recording, everything is exactly the same. There's, there's a few buttons have changed and they've moved the full auto switch from uh, down here to up here and my best advice is put a bit of gaffer tape over it because you never want to use that because it's just it's, you're gonna hit you can hit it so easily and suddenly you're shooting you're like why am i at 16,000 iso whoops full auto turn it off so on the fs um seven you can hear it as it changes it's an optical filter being put over the sensor and it has three different strengths and clear has anybody here used a variable ND on an FS5? Okay. Yeah, just, uh, I was working for a company and they hired one in. Right. So, at the moment I'm on clear. So it's going to preset. And I put, switch it to the first, first stage. That's the, that's the third stage, whoops, sorry. There we go. First stage, so you can hear the electronics. It's actually an electronic filter going over it. And now when I change to the next one, there's no noise. It's all electronic. So that is the presets, because all it really is doing is using the variable ND and putting a set mark on it. So if I switch this to uh, variable, I now have control over it on this dial. Make sure it's switched not on iris, but ND. But if you're using, if you're using a, uh, a cine lens like this with a proper iris, then you're not gonna have that issue anyway. You're always gonna use the barrel. So I was filming on Brighton Beach, was it Monday? Uh, with the FS7 and this, and an FS5 and actually a Canon lens. And I needed to get, there was one shot, um, and it was a really beautiful shot with the right amount of bokeh wide open. And, but the only way I can get the correct exposure was to put more shutter in, because the ND was either too strong or not strong enough. So I was like, I either put uh, some, some more available ND on the front, or change the shutter speed. So I ended up changing the shutter speed to get it wide open. Whereas on this, you're not, you're not defined by the amount of light, you're defined by 
you can choose what you want it to look like. So if I wanted to be shooting wide open, I can. I just change my exposure via the ND to what I want it to be. And it's, it's, it's as smooth as changing the, the iris actually on the camera. So this variable ND, once you've used it, it's really hard to go back. As I say, I, was, I, was, I couldn't get the depth of that I wanted um, using the FS7 Mark I on Monday because I, you, know, you can't get your exposure right because the jumps on the ND wheel uh, are too big or not enough. So you have to use additional filters or change your other settings. So this way, with the variable ND, you can have the f-stop that you want, keep the correct shutter speed, and get your exposure via the ND, dial it into exactly where you want it to be. That's, that's by far the biggest feature, I think, of this camera. Sort of thing, I want them all, all the Sony cameras, I'm sure they will at some point, probably not the A7 cameras, but all the video cameras will have it at some point because it makes so much sense. Oh, yes, loads of things I don't like about it, for sure. Um, the menus. The fact that I would like to be able to, there's loads of programmable buttons, but it doesn't let you program every feature you want to that. So, for example, I would like one of these buttons to put me into high frame rate 180 instantly. That would be great. It doesn't let me do that. That's the sort of stuff I would like. Are there any situations where you can't get over the LCD? Like sunlight, you'd have to use perhaps a better external recorder? Oh, right, so I never use this. <laughs> this is on the shelf in my office somewhere. Uh, I have a Secuto Gratical EVF on here, uh, which is a terrific EVF. And I also have a small HD 702 high bright monitor, which I use as well. So um, the screen is, this is okay. Uh, I don't like the loop at all, being completely frank. Um, it's the same loop as the FS700. Very plasticky. It's not, it's not the sort of thing I like. Um, but hey, it's better than nothing. At least it does have a loop, whereas the FS5 doesn't even have one. And the EVF on the back of the FS5 is not good. Which I always find really weird because the EVF on their stills cameras are better than the EVFs on their video cameras. Don't ask me why. I have no idea. There must be a reason to it. But um, this is quite nice in that you have, not that I can flick it up all the time, there. It's not just as, as a shield, but just putting it in your bag, and it's happened to me once is the LCD can, you know, because it's not protected, it can crack. It did crack once, because somebody put, it wasn't me, somebody put a battery in the bag, dropped the battery in the bag, and straight onto the LCD. So but this protects it, which is nice. Little features like that. Um, the other thing is that's improved is, if you're using the internal system, which I've actually take, taken mine off, <coughs> this, when you put weight on it, it sort of, goes round. They've got a new square system on here. You can see it here. Do it, which is nice as well. It's your horizon, it's always in level. It's always good to have a nice horizon rather than have to fix it in post all the time. Uh, the other cool thing, I mean, the other nice thing about the Sony is actually is uh, this. That shows you your horizon. Oh, that's my vertical horizon, obviously, because I'm tilted down. But when you're handheld, you can see where your horizon is from there which is a really nice thing to have. If all your shots are put both green, then you need to start varying your shots a bit. Little things. I mean, this has still been pimped out, hasn't it? It's, um, it's got the MoffCam cage on it. It's got a new mount system on there, and it's got a better um, shoulder plate. It's all about ergonomics. If you're going to shoot handheld, you don't want to get tired, and you need to get it comfy. I mean, currently this is pushed, this is quite far back. Um, you can unscrew it and move it to here or to here and find the position that's good for your hand. So the bottom right one is on the mod cam. Yeah, that's mod cam only. These are the two. Uh, this, is, this is normally where it goes. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> this gives you more options. Yeah, I, have a I mean, come and have a play with them. I'm still here and ask about them. Um, but yeah, this is these are the most. This lens is an absolute joy to shoot with. It absolutely is. And um, I'm going to get the uh, the longer one to shoot with. Do some test footage in May. So hopefully that'll be out sort of like July, June, July time. The actual lens. And then you get two lenses which will cover most of your range you're really going to need for most filming, which will be really nice. I mean, the lens I used to use prior to this on this sort of camera is actually on the C100 Mark II over there, the 17-55 Canon. 
God, just use this and then go over there and fit, play with that. Like, oh my God, it's just awful. Optically it was fine, but mechanically a complete nightmare. So, there we go. All right, well, thank you very much. And come out. Thank you. Thank you.